Well, next up on the podcast, uh, presented by Capital Sports Fieldhouse, it's the Prep Spotlight, and we have very successful coach of the Morris Orioles eight-man squad, Kendall Crockett. And Kendall, uh, the season maybe didn't end the way you wanted it to, but still, you had a lot of highlights this season. You've had a lot of highlights over at Morris, especially since the Orioles went to eight-man football. Thanks for joining us here on the podcast, and uh, let's talk about, to start with, this year's Orioles squad. Uh, you know, overall, uh, 15 kids, 14 that could suit up over the course of the season there at the end. Um, we lost over 10 seniors last season, all of which started on the offense and defensive lines and offense and defense in general. We lost our 2,500-yard rusher, Wyatt Wesley. Uh, so we had to replace the entire offensive line. We had to replace the entire defense except for one, uh, two players. So we went into the season kind of with a bunch of question marks, not knowing what we were going to do. Um, it took about four or five weeks before we figured out the actual offensive line that we settled on and finished with at Menden. Um, obviously a much different dynamic than what we were last season, but overall we were a very fast team. We were small, but we were very fast. And what we did do, we did effectively. Cool. Coach, can you, uh, for, for the listeners, even maybe, you know, some other people uh, checking, checking out the podcast, just give us a quick rundown of the difference between eight player and 11 player football, other than the simple eight players versus 11 players. Is it, you know, a lot of play calling differences or, you know, can you just break that down for us real quick? I think uh, the biggest difference that you'll probably find if you watch both uh, fashions of football, you play to your strength. If you have a quarterback uh, like Colin, uh, they had Simon Vinson, an amazing quarterback. They threw it to Wiki, uh, who broke all kinds of state records. Uh, two years ago, when we played them, they were a, an option-based program. Uh, they had a really a smaller quarterback that couldn't throw as well, but they were awesome at doing the uh, the option. When we our second year, we had a quarterback Nick Hart that could throw the ball. Uh, we throw for through for over. Uh, 2,000 yards, and then we switched our offense because we didn't have any quarterbacks coming through. I think 11-man programs with the number of kids that they have are more fortunate or more apt to have the same offense in place year to year, whereas eight-man, you have to kind of figure out, okay, we can't throw the ball next year because I don't have a quarterback coming up until, you know, four years from now. Sure. So you have to kind to kind of change the offense and the defense, depending on what kind of players you have there as well. So I, I would say that's probably the biggest difference. I, I, we actually had the opportunity to talk with uh, Simon Vincent and Justin Wiki and their head coach, uh, Robbie Hatton. We're doing a story on them for the uh, state finals this year. Uh, and he said uh, with eight man, he said offense comes easy. He says it's, it's not that hard to put up points. He said that the defensive side of the ball is the hard one to coach. He said he always feels like he's a guy short on defense. Uh, do, do you agree with that statement? Does Is defense kind of where – your, your bread is made when it comes to eight-man football? Yeah, if, if you can't stop anybody from the defensive side of the ball, you're, you're not winning eight-man games. Um, at least you're not going to win probably a state championship or go right. deep in the playoffs. Um, our 2018 team, we gave up around eight points a game. Uh, <laughs> we were scoring around 40 to 50. Wow. And like Robbie said, you're always one man short because an 11-man, you have that high safety. You can roll them over the top. You can do different coverages. You can run cover two. You can't run a lot of the coverages you can in 11 man because you're minus that one extra uh, right. body. Hmm. But yeah, you're going to, you're going to win more games than you lose. If you have a good defense, um, you, linebackers are key. Obviously your defensive ends. Uh, if, if you catch a seam in eight man football, for the most part, you're gone. Uh, if you have a fast running back, like we had Hunter Nowak a couple of years ago, Wyatt Wesley uh, last year, if you, if you catch a seam, you're pretty much going to go to a pay dirt. Whereas in 11 man, you have that high safety over the top that can kind of come down and fill those alleys. Kendall, you talk about Wyatt Wesley and it's kind of like the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. You know, you had a chance to win a state championship. I want to get your thoughts on what that felt like, you know, making the trip up to the superior dome, that whole experience. And then last year, you know, you guys had a heck of a team and that had a, had to be a bitter pill to swallow with that L at the end, huh? It was, you know, you go into and you break a lot of records uh, rushing wise. You look at the offense, you look at the offensive line. Um, and that's what you say to yourself, like this, 
the only way that you lose is if you beat yourself. Mm -hmm. And which quite honestly is something we, we talked about that entire week. I thought we had, I thought we had by far the better football program than Colin that season. Um, they came in, Colin came in, they played a heck of a game. But overall, when you lose a game like that and it becomes final, that that's the end of your season, you you kind of go and you, you have to find something else to do yeah. for a couple weeks because obviously you're not coaching football at that point. And it is. It's a tough pill to swallow because I knew whoever won our bracket, our side was going to go into and probably beat Aubrey which mm -hmm. Colin did, and that was your ticket to going up north to the Dome. And then when you're sitting there watching Colin play um, North Powers, and all you're thinking in the back of your mind is, that should be you, that should be you. Yeah. But at the same time, you're saying, well, it's not, because we didn't hang on to the ball like we should have. Right. I definitely, when you're saying that, yeah, this is 20 years ago, but I had those same feelings when we lost in the second round of the playoffs. So I, I can definitely, I can, I can feel what you're saying. Uh, yeah. One more question for me, coach. Uh, let, let's talk about Morris, like the community. One of my sisters married into a family that's deeply rooted in, in the Morris community. And uh, now they've got one, their son is going to be coming up. So maybe he might be playing football for you and, 10, about 10 years, 10 or 11 years, he might be playing football for you. But okay. um, the Morris community, how, how big is it to have that backing and, you know, the support and just a community like Morris that, you know, is all, all about following you guys around? They would have followed you all the way, or they did when you made it to the Dome. They would have followed you all over, you know, wherever you took your team. How, how big is that for the players and for you to see? I mean, it's always nice to, when you're doing something that you love doing, and the kids are doing the same. It's always nice to have people there to support you, win or lose, to support you. Um, and it's just, it's nice to be able to, you know, go to a home game and see that your home uh, crowd is there, that the the, the uh, stands are completely packed. And we travel well. Uh, mm -hmm. We just packed the stands when we went to Menden this last week. Um and played them and that was a that was a hard fought game for us and we held our own for a bit but i mean mendon just kind of took it to us at the end but yeah the the morris football tradition is it's strong i mean i'm looking at the football board right now for league champs it goes all the way back to 1956 hmm. and there's about 10 of them up on there uh we've been really successful the last uh well eight of the last nine years um as an eight-man program and you know, we just want to keep things moving in the same direction they're going for the the kids that are coming up from the elementary school. Well, I want to go back to the uh, state championship for a second. I've always wondered this when it when it comes to a, a player. Um, how do you like the Superior Dome as as a state championship setting? Uh, let's say that we could move, you know, the eight player cha player championships to Ford Field on Thanksgiving weekend. Would you rather play in Ford Field, or, or is there something special about that place? You know. A lot of people, I mean, it totally depends on who you talk to on this, but for me, I think the experience up at the Superior Dome is really second to none. They do a great job up there. Sorry, I'm yeah. plugging something in real quick. No, nope, it's okay. Um, the overall experience going up there, you know, playing in the largest wooden structure dome in the world, I think it's the only wooden structure dome in the world that they play in. It's a neat experience, and, and traveling on the bus – you know, the eight-hour trip up north, stopping halfway around Mackinac, getting some food, things like that. No. Overall, the experience for the entire team, the entire um, uh, community is just – it's amazing. And they do a great job up at that facility. Yeah, I agree with you, Kendall. Uh, I've done a handful of games up there, including state championship games. And, in fact, in fact, I think we did your, uh, your state championship up there. But uh, it is a great facility. Uh you know, the whole trip with the team, it's a team bonding thing. It is really cool. But the question I have for you is, uh, I don't know if there's been talk about it. You know, I know you guys in eight-man football play one less playoff game. But is that, has there been any talk about that uh, semifinal should be at a neutral site and not, you know, at the at the home team with the more points? I mean, I thought that was a little bit unfair. I think it should be the same as 11-man and neutral site on turf. Yeah, yeah. Um... I think a neutral field would, would obviously be good for both teams. Uh, Menden would probably disagree. They probably enjoyed having home field. 
as would I if I had home field. But um, moving forward with the teams that are coming in, I think we're getting about five to ten more teams this year. And when we get those teams in, maybe when we start getting bigger to the point where we're like a Division Eight or a Division Seven, maybe we start following some of the the parameters that are set in place for those other teams. All right. Well, we're going to let you get back to your hall monitoring duties. It looks like <laughs> uh, I got to send a shout out though to well, we'll call you Mister Morris Football. No question, your success over there has been unparalleled. I think. Uh, Mr. Morris Sports, though, Andy Flynn. I got to send a shout out to him. He's an old timer like me. He lives and breathes Morris Athletics, and uh, I know he's been a big part of of stuff you do, right? He's he's at every event. It's not just football, and he's done he's done stats since I've been here uh, coaching with Brad Long in 2007. Mm-hmm. So he's always doing football. He do, does the girls, boys basketball. Yeah, he's. You want to talk about who Mr. Morris is, that's absolutely Andy Flynn. Well, listen, Kendall, we'll be watching you further. I love what's been going on over there at Morris. I mean, the Field of Dreams is looking great. They got the press box finally installed yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. You know, everything's moving forward for Morris Orioles uh, football. We hope you're there a long time. We'll be checking in with you periodically. Thanks for the time today. Okay, appreciate it, guys. Thank you very much. Thank Bye-bye. you. Capital Sports Field House is the home of hit and pitch and a whole lot more. The 10,000 square foot turf field can be used for all indoor sports training, including football, baseball, basketball, softball, soccer, and many other activities. Hit and Pitch has seven indoor batting cages with full pitching tunnel and the state of the art hit tracks training system utilized by MLB organizations. Located in the old Capital Bowl J.C. Penny block on South Washington in Owasso, Michigan. For more details, call Capital Sports and Hit and Pitch at 989-472-4624 or online at capitalsportsfh.com. Okay, thanks again to Kendall Crockett for joining us to talk a little Morris Orioles football. And speaking of football, uh, we got one team standing from our area, New Lothrop. They surprise, were, surprise. The yeah, New surprise, <laughs> exactly. They uh, they took care of business at Hornet Field, 26 championship drive on Friday night, downing uh, Elkton Pigeon Bayport, Laker, 29 to 20. Their quarterback, Jack Kalhanek, yeah, he's, he's having a nice year. You know, two good junior quarterbacks, really, that we can point to. You know, both Kalhanek and obviously Wyatt Bauer of Corona. But Kalhanek had three touchdowns in the air, over 200 yards, and then ran for a touchdown as well. And uh, they got a big lineman, goes both ways. Jaden Curry had 17 tackles. And Jeez. speaking of big, I don't know if you caught any of the game. Laker was with their backup quarterback, and this kid – was a 250 pounder quarterback oh. was uh, Ethan Wisner, and he just ran the shotgun, ran power plays to himself almost the whole game. I mean, he was a load, and New Lothrop did a pretty good job uh, physically with him. It was it was a fun game. Was the was that just the strategy because of the backup quarterback? Like, would they be passing Laker if they had their starting quarterback, or is that just the offense they run? Not as much. It was it was still similar offense because they ran the shotgun uh, and they would direct snap it to the running back to his right or left every once in a while as well. But uh, he was the main load. You know, he threw he threw a nice deep pass, but I think he was zero for eleven on the game passing oh. the ball. <laughs> so so New Lothar pretty much had eleven guys in the box. You know, yep. we, talk, we did talk about this on the broadcast, guys, and I think you'll appreciate this. Uh, Clint Galvis, obviously you know, one of the real top coaches, not only in our area, but in the state, you know, we talked about, you know, he runs such a multifaceted offense. And when you're seeing that at basically a class D school, I mean, that, that says a whole heck of a lot. And they, they, the other team doesn't know anything, what they're going to be running at them. I mean, it's just all you, over the place. I've been in the booth before when you're watching it, man, you are mesmerized by, by their offense. It, it, it is smart, man. It's, it's simple stuff. A lot of motion. Um, he, he, he loves to dial up the trick plays, which in high school, man, I mean, those those will score almost half the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it, very advanced offense, and it's smart, and he keeps it. It looks like it's very complicated, but it's just a lot a lot of the same stuff, just out of different formations. Mid, misdirection, and, like, really, it doesn't have to be, like, trick plays. It doesn't have mm-hmm. to be, like, the triple reverse running back pass. You know, it, it, sometimes in high school, if you can execute it, that's obviously the big part. All you have to do is like a little misdirection in motion, like you said, Jared. And yeah, you're going to throw the defense off, even in the playoffs, even against some of the best teams in the state. 
because, you know, you can't really prepare for it. But we've talked to Clint Galvis, Coach Galvis, on the podcast a number of times, and I'm just always so impressed at the commitment to the program that the players have because, mm-hmm. you know, just thinking back to my time, you know, you, you think about your experience when you're talking about this 20 years ago when I played. We were very committed. We were, for sure. I'm not trying to shortchange anything, but we also, a lot of us played multiple sports or, to be honest, a lot of people, you know, were farmers or, you know, had, had other things that they were very committed to. And to hear coaches like even John Webb with Durand, you know, talking about the commitment that the players have, you got to have that. If you're going to run an offense like that, you can't just like in July be like, Hey guys, we're going to, we're going to throw this offense at you. Let's, let's see if we can get it by our first game, you know? So it, it is impressive. Well, as Jared said, I'm, I guess I'm mesmerized by it. I didn't realize I was, but I was just sending out props that, you know, here, this is a class D school. Yeah. A lot of misdirection, a lot of different plays. I mean, they started off the game guys, they were down six, nothing. And first play from scrimmage, they ran play action with a faking a, a counter play. They had a kid so open. I have never seen this before 25 yards open on just a, a, a post pattern over the middle of the field and the poor kid dropped it. The pass was oh. right on the money, I've never, but they bounced back from that. But hey, Clint Galvis, I'm going to say it again too. Uh, great coach. Obviously he picked up win number 144 tying Nick and nice all time for second in our area trails. Only Byron's Roger Bayshore, who has 157 career wins. Galvis is going to destroy that. Yeah, right. it, and on top of that, you know, I went down, had some pregame chat with him about, you know, keys of the game, that type of BS, you know, broadcasters have to get. And uh, I, I was walking away and I turned around and said, hey, by the way, how old are you, Clint? He said, I turned 40 tomorrow. So he turned You're 40 really? on Saturday and got his big win there for a birthday present. So that's pretty cool. That's impressive. Wow. I mean, I, I mean, he's still young, but I would have guessed he was like thir- like thirty four. He's just he's so he's so energetic and like yes. he just would be a blast to play for. I've always thought he that. would be. And no I know doubt. we've asked him on the podcast, and maybe he's just not telling us. But um, we've asked him, you know, if he has college aspirations to, to coach in college or you know anything like that, and he's mm-hmm. told us at this point, no. You know, he's happy at New Lothrop. He's got his kids coming through and all that kind right. of stuff. So. He's got a good thing going there. I mean, if you got a program built like that, why, to an extent, unless you want to coach in college, why would yep. you want to leave? I mean, well, you know, you're right. It could, could happen down. Year. It could happen down the road. Who knows? He's 40, so it could happen 10, 15 yeah. years down the road if you wanted to make a move. And it, you know, I got a backup question on that too because I, the the superintendent of schools, Anthony Berthum, came over and chatted with us a little bit at halftime. I asked him specifically that question. I said, "Hey, man, what do you think? Is uh, Clint going to stick around here?" And he says, "Oh, yeah." He'll be here for a mm-hmm. while. His kids are here. He's happy. You know, things are going good. So that's he, cool, man. Yeah, he's talking about somebody uh, who if he stays, if he stays coaching as long as he possibly can, he will he will win. He might win this the set the state record. I, I if he possibly. coaches coaches until he drops. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's definitely well, impressive. And uh you mentioned their opponent coming up, they're playing. Uh, up Traverse Claire, City, they've, Fra- they've got a tough game coming up, right? Yeah, number one in the state, Traverse City, St. Francis. It'll be a repeat of, I think, 2018 when they played New Lothrop, picked up the win in that one in a hard-fought game. I mean, the, the stat that just totally jumps out at everybody is, you know, Traverse City, St. Francis pounded, you know, number three, Ithaca, 63 to nothing. I mean, wow. think about that. It yeah. was, I think it was 50 to nothing at half. Wow. <laughs> it's, incredible so the hornets are going to have their hands full you know i i got a feeling they're going to be ready can't come right out and say they're going to win but uh you don't you know they saw that score too and they're going to say nobody in the state nobody in the country would believe we can win this game and they'll they'll have that chip on their shoulders i think yeah all right well we're gonna talk a little uh football college and pro again all our teams won last weekend we'll get into that right after this <laughs> 